Wrestling fans around the corner on the world. Welcome to another installment of our hit series, Memories and Legends. I'm Dan Marotti, joined by... WWE Hall of Famer, Mr. USA, Tony Atlas. Tony, we missed you on the August episodes of Memories and Legends. You were replaced by Demolition. How did it feel to be on the, the, the outside looking in, so to speak? We missed you. I think the discrimination. Why is that? For my looks. Your looks? Yeah. You're not handsome enough compared to Axe and Smash? No, because I am so that dumb handsome. That you, they, they always discriminate against the best looking kid in the in the school. You're too good looking. Is that, that what you're trying to point. say? Yeah, yeah. Well, Bill was a little thin on the moss upstairs. Yeah. You like to wear the hat to cover to it cover up. To cover it up, that's right. right. Because the last time I was here, you promised me a job and you didn't give it to me. What was the job going to be? You're going to stick my face in dough and make gorilla cookies. Well, it'd be better than where Lanny Poffo sticks his face. Oh, there we go. Right <laughs> different story for a different yeah. time. Fans, we're going to be back with another great episode of Memories and Legends after we say hello to our friends. You and that Lanny Poffo, <laughs> I'll tell you. Are you part of a nonprofit organization, a youth group looking to raise cash for your cause? Stay tuned at the end of this video to learn how you can bring the action and excitement of the Millennium Wrestling Federation to your town live, featuring the superstars and legends of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. San Francisco, WWE returns after seven years for its debut at the new Chase Center. Be a part of back-to-back -back nights of live televised events. First with Monday Night Raw, as Seth Rollins, Braun Strowman, and Ricochet battle the OC in a six-man tag team match. Then it's SmackDown Live, as Kofi Kingston collides with Randy Orton for the WWE Championship, plus see Roman Reigns. It's Monday Night Raw on September 23rd, and WWE SmackDown Live on Tuesday, September 24th. Tickets and ringsider packages are available. This is Mick Foley. This is Harley Race. This is Shelton Benjamin. This is Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff. This is the Monster Abyss. And this is Daniel Bryan. This is JBL, and you're watching the MWF. Be there live. Wrestling fans, welcome back. WWE pay-per-view weekends. You know what that means, Tony? No. We got announcement galores and we have brand new memories and legends. The Wrestling Insider Show is a fun when we talk about current events, but a lot of the fans like to talk about the history of this great sport that sometimes gets neglected. We don't like to neglect anyone here, right? I, don't I think, think the do. most neglected part of the sport in 1985 yeah. was the last year of wrestling. Mm -hmm. There's no more wrestling. Yeah. It's sports entertainment. Mm -hmm. When I started, it was called wrestling. Everything was about wrestling. Mm -hmm. Now it's about sports entertainment. And what people is missing is wrestling. That's what it was. Vince McMahon and I croaked. Ted Turner lost because he was in the wrestling business. I won because I was in the entertainment business. Mm -hmm. We keep talking about a sport, about an organization that don't exist anymore. Andre the Giant was a wrestler. Hulk Hogan was a wrestler. Randy Savage was a wrestler. Kurt Henning was a wrestler. Dory Funk Jr. was a wrestler. Abdul the Butcher was a wrestler. King Kong Bruiser Brody was a wrestler. They don't have wrestlers anymore. They have sports entertainment. The, biz, the word wrestling should be taken out of the scenario. It don't exist anymore. You think they should change uh, the name to just world entertainment? Every interview I ever do, they always talk about sports entertainment. They never, I have very rarely did an interview that talk about the wrestlers, the Killer Kowalski, the Klondike Bill, the Earth, the Red, the Harley Races, you know. They don't even mention these people because these people was around during the time where it was wrestling, where you got paid for how many asses you put in the seat, how tough you was, 
and how good of a wrestler you were, like Dory Funk uh, Jr., like Terry Funk, like Ric Flair. Ric Flair is the last of the Mohegan. What do you mean by that? There's no more wrestlers. He's the last wrestler. He, uh, there's no more wrestlers. All right, Tony. Well, in this episode, the fans have asked Look at them when you tell me they wrestle. They do everything but wrestle. Think about it. They chop meat and high spot and talk. No wrestling. Chop high spots and yeah. talk. Now, Is they, that what now you they, they had a guy that did wrestle. Unfortunately, we talked about him a, a couple of episodes back about uh, the, the kid that was uh, uh, married to a woman. Chris Benoit. Chris Benoit. Now, that was a wrestler. He was that a worker. That was a wrestler. Bret Hart was a wrestler. When a guy, 90% of a guy matches is punches and kicks. 90% of it is punches and kicks. How can you call him a wrestler? It's when not he, much work. He don't even get yeah. a wrestling hope. Yeah. I agree with you on that. He don't even get a hope. Yeah. I mean, there's very little bit of wrestling goes on in these matches. People don't see wrestling at them all. They see high spot, what we call high spot, and chopping meat. Chopping meat and punching and kicking in the wrestling That's it. That, They don't see wrestling no more. We used to do interview. Now they do 30 minute, what do you call these shows like, uh, a, a 30 minute show like the, the George Jefferson or Rick Fox. A sitcom. Fox. Sitcom. An interview, a long interview in my day, when a man said, you got two minutes. And that was it. You they must have had minutes. a hard time with you, considering how long some no, of these interviews go No, they, had, they did not. Everybody did it that way. You know that. You're not you good with interviews. the time cues. Yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah but, but, but you see my interviews. So I've you know, seen them. No, I'm just right, teasing about two I'm minutes. Teasing they, had, they would cut you the camera You hit the two minutes. You could not go beyond it. The camera went off. Right. So you had to... Hit, get, your, hit your time. Got to get hit your, your time, yeah. baby. Uh, that's right. And, 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 they, and they, it, we call it a promo. Mm -hmm. That was all the talking people seen. The rest was, we did the rest in the ring. But the guys don't know how to wrestle no more. So here's how they do it. They set off all these freaking firecrackers at the beginning to jar you. Well, they haven't done that in years, Tony. Yeah, There's no the pyro in here. Pyro, firecracker, whatever. No pyro. Jaw the hell out of everybody. None. You know, jaw the Nilch. hell out of everybody, right? Get Nada. everybody. Yeah, yeah, get everybody All going. Right. Get everybody going. All right, well. And then as soon as the people start getting bored, they shoot them damn rockets off again. There's no rockets anymore, though. Just what? WrestleMania. That's it. No oh. more pyro. Oh, they're getting cheap. For about 10 years now, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah, well, I guess you missed the first couple of minutes. That's all right. I even found out something about the ring. What did you find out about the ring? There's not enough gold on WWE ring. The only gold is just the paint. The only what? The, not even 14 karat. 14 karat gold on the ring? No, they did not 14 karat. What they ring? Less. The wrestling ring? Oh, the Hall of Fame ring. Yeah, I thought you meant the wrestling yeah, ring. Yeah. What kind of gold is on that? The lady I'm going to have evaluated, she said the same stuff that they make nickels out of. Wait a minute. You had that ring evaluated. By no. who? I went to a jeweler. What do you think your name is? Larry Shreve? Well, no. She, she said it's the same metal that you make nickels out of. How much did she say it was worth? About, she said about 50 bucks. <laughs> She said she gave me $50 for it. She said, without knowing the sentimental value and that's the, all, that's the, part. the that's collectible the part. value yeah, of but, it because but of what it is. Yeah, but it's the material part. It's worth about 50 bucks. 50 bucks, yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. What does that say? <laughs> well, that could say a lot, but we're not going to go there, Tony. In this episode, we're going to talk about some of the individuals that are responsible. For sentimental, I can get five grand because it's so Larry Shreve like, got 20. Uh, yeah, but... but yeah, the guy paid twenty five dollars for a, a fifty dollar ring. A fifty dollar. Let ring. me ask you, who's going to get your ring when your time comes, Tony? That you go home. What do you mean? As Quincy Rustani would say, "Going home." I'm gonna give it back. No, going home. Yeah, no, I'm gonna give it back. Who are you gonna give it to? The the WWE Hall of Fame. You're gonna give the WWE non-existent Hall of Fame your ring for them Wait, to no, do nothing. No, no, not the Hall of Fame. They 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 they, they, they building a. Uh, uh, 
A museum. Where? Florida, what they've been saying. When? I don't know. That's not going to happen. Are you kidding me? They've been talking about that for 10 years now. You're going to so, give Vince your Hall of Fame ring back. Yeah. For nothing. For free. Yeah. yeah. Why? Who else am I going to give it to? I got no family. Well, we, we could put it right here on the set and put it in a nice case for the fans to I enjoy. I ain't got no family. Don't all give it I to got, Vince. The only, person, the only person in this world that I got is my wife, Monica. And you got us. I don't have any kids. I don't have any grandkids. You have a daughter. I don't have, I don't have any kids. Right, I don't have well, any grandkids. The, so only person, right now. the only person in my life, I met three women my whole life that cared about me. Your mother? My mother, your my grandmother, and, and Monica. Monica. That's it. I got one person on this planet that cares about me. That well, would we give, care about that you. That would give me without asking for anything in return. My wife would give to me and would never look for anything in return. Yeah, there's a lot of people that do for me, but they want something in return. It's called business associates. But I have one friend, one person that cares about Tony. People say they care about Bruiser Bro until he got stabbed in the dress room. People say they cared about Vader, and one week out they dead, they act like he never lived. They didn't care about Leo. N not out they were gone. Bundy, people say, oh, I like Bundy. And then he died, they don't even show up for They forget film. about him. As soon as you're gone. And I think that's the sin in it. That's, no, that's it's human. It's not the sin in it. That's, that's us. Human nature. Human nature. I look at 9-11. So the, the, the following year, I put on a shirt with a big flag on the front. To support I these, America. I had these pants, red, white, and blue with stars, sweatpants. Mm -hmm. Walked into the gym. Guy walked up to me on 9-11, one year later, one year later. He asked me, he said, what you dress up for, Tony? It's not the 4th of July. I said, you know what day it is? <laughs> no, what day is it? I said, it's 9-11. Or what? What that for to me? I said, you, you, don't, you don't know what 9-11 was? He one forgot less than a year later what 9-11 was. One year later. I see little kids get shoot in school. Walk down the street. Nobody discussing it. They show it on the news maybe for, for a couple of hours. Then they forget about it. Cool, let me ask you this, story. I watched people get flood a couple months ago out in the Midwest. They show it maybe, maybe 15 minutes of it. Then it was, it was over with. We, you sit and watch the news right now tonight. night. You're not going to hear nothing about people. You're going to hear about the stock market, the economy doing great. Yeah, if you got stock, it's doing fantastic if you're a stock owner. But what about the guy working five or six jobs? That can't the guy, invest. Uh, right, the guy, the, the guy that, that can't afford to pay his mortgage or the guy that, that is walking to work every day or the kid that go out and work and have to live with his parents because he can't afford an apartment. Yeah. And it, the life ain't so, it ain't such a great economy for that person. No. And that's about 70% of America. So the economy, yes, is fantastic for 30% of America. It's just shits for the other 70%. But nobody talking about it. Nobody cares. Nobody cares until it happened to them directly. Then they care. Until, until it hit your doorstep, nobody cares. You know, I just saw on TV where the hurricane and tornadoes went through the Mideast, where they yeah. had a storm man, and showed the houses, yeah. with the boats and the houses all turned. Nobody cares. But then in 1990, the two, I mean 2000, uh, the early 2000s, when, when, that, when New Orleans got flooded and everything, Katrina. they talked about it. Yep. When New Jersey got flooded out, they talked about it. Now in the Midwest, I was just, I just left, uh, where the hell did I fly to? Somewhere. Yep, yeah, I remember flying over and I saw these houses. I you thought saw it was floods? Houseboats. Well, I thought it was houseboats. Yeah. And I said, there ain't no houseboat, that's flood. And the promoter said, oh yeah, half of this area. I was flying to St. Louis, Missouri. Mm -hmm. I was going to St. Louis. And half of Kansas and Missouri is on the freaking water. Half of Kansas. It, I mean, f when you're up in the plane and you look at it. That's what it looks like. That's what it looked like. Wow. I mean, all I saw was houses and water. It was houses sitting in water. And I said, shoot, I didn't even see this on TV. They didn't even show it. 
People in Massachusetts and in Maine don't even know it happened. Nobody cared. Well, they can't care if you don't see it. That's it. It's about, all about they what they was talking about. companies want to present to you. All they was talking about on all three channels were the Mueller report and President Trump. Nothing else. Nothing else matters. You turn your TV on right now, it's all about Trump. Nothing else. It's like the, it's, there's nothing else going on in this world. The, the deficit is higher now than it ever been. You don't even hear about it. Yeah. Our grandkids and kids are going to be stuck with that deficit that nobody paying no attention to. Our health care system is horrible. Yeah. Nobody talking about it. You got, right now, me and you talk, if you look at the statistics, there's people being shot in Chicago. A lot of them. Yes. You don't hear nothing about it. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. All right, Tony, something we do care about here in the world of memories and legends, the world of professional wrestling, the history of this great sport. The fans wanted to try and break down the dynamic of the kingpins of professional wrestling. We're going to start off with a man that helped get you that $50 ring. We're talking about a man you met back in, I believe, the late 1970s, Vince McMahon Sr., Tony. Do you have any interesting thoughts, recollections on Vince Sr., man that was the promoter, the owner of WWE when it was known as the Worldwide Wrestling Federation, WWWF. He was a real man. You liked Vince Sr. Oh, who yeah. didn't? I never met him. Nope, you can't dislike him. He was honest, straightforward. He was a man's man, you know, straightforward. He would give anybody a chance, and he would give you a second chance. He was very understanding, very forgiving, and uh, a very good businessman. And he was, he was honest as the day was long. He treated you with respect. He treated everybody with respect. Not just me, everybody. He was a, he was a perfect gentleman. Yeah. He, he was a great, great individual. Uh, he, he always had treated me good. I have no ill feelings towards him whatsoever. And he, kept, he took care of his friends. I mean, he gave guys jobs uh, like Freddie Blassett, Lou Albano, that was year beyond their performance They year. were done. Yeah, the, the Grand Wizard and all these guys, you know. Uh, he could have just kicked them to the curb. Baron Secluna, he kept him around. Uh, uh, Dominic DiNucci, uh, Johnny Rod, these guys were not big money maker for him, but right. he kept them. He was loyal. He was very loyal to people that was loyal to him. He kept them working. You know, he didn't just get rid of them just because they couldn't do drop kicks in the ring no more. Mm -hmm. He found another position for these people. So he was a, 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 a one, uh, uh, one of the, uh, the promoters that we would never see again. We would never see people like that no more. These people are gone from our uh, world of, of entertainment, and, they, and I don't ever think we're ever going to get anybody in the wrestling world that could hold uh, a straw to him. If I had a problem with uh, Vince Sr. would come and talk to me mm -hmm. and find out how can we fix this problem. Now if I have a problem, they won't say nothing to me. Nothing. That's why so many guys don't know when they're doing right or when they're doing wrong because the office will never talk to you. No communication. No communication between the office and the boys. None. What is your... Then you find out You find out when you messed up, when you get your notice when you go home. But they would tell you that day, you okay, everything is wonderful. Not, not so much when you get the envelope in the mail. And then you get home, you get the envelope. Yeah. Vince Sr. would come up to you and say, look, Tony, uh, we're going to have to release you in 30 days. Or is there any place I can help you go? Really? Mm -hmm. He helped you out on the way out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this, Tony. Do you, what is your initial memory of Vince McMahon Sr. when you came in when you were down in, I believe, Georgia, and you started to work the uh, WWWF TV tapings for mm -hmm. a period of time before you came in full time? Right. That, that's how they did everybody. Mm -hmm. That's how they did everybody. They got you over with the people first. Right. 
And then after they get over the people, they start putting you in the house show. See, what it was, he said he want the people to get to want you. Mm -hmm. And then when they, they keep showing you, keep showing you, but you can't get it. Right. It's kind of like a stripper. Yeah. You know, you see her every night on stage, but you want to you want a date with her. So you, he make you wait until you want that date. Mm -hmm. Instead of throwing you out there, he, he, he built up the interest first. And that's how, the, that's how you did everybody that came in. You did TV taping for probably about a month or so before they even put you on the house show. Yeah. You were, I believe, a more extended run of just TV tapings where you were still a regular down in Georgia. It was several months before you came in full time for WWWF. Yeah. Is yeah. that correct? Yeah, yeah. Because, see, they, they, I was one of these people that uh, you didn't see every day. Yeah. So Vince was not the only promoter that wanted me to, to work. I mean, Paul Bosch was calling me. Bill Watts was calling me. So I was kind of like me and Brody and Abdullah. We were kind of like all over the place. Everybody wanted you. Yeah, yeah, because I was unusual for that period of time. Right. Today I'm I'm be I, I would be uh, average, but there wasn't many bodybuilders in the world of wrestling that could do head scissors and drop kicks. See, if you watch my match, I never did a, the only the only feat of strength I did was the press slam. Right. The rest was wrestling. And, I, and, and John Reeves said, what was so good about it, you could fly, and as you call that, because I, I did area move, yeah. leapfrog, yeah. head scissors, drop kick, and you take all your other muscle men, they didn't do that. You, you, you were unique. Right, right, I was unique. You never saw Ivy Pascal or Superstar Billy Graham throw a drop kick or a head scissors or a leapfrog. They didn't do that. You know, it was always the smaller guy. It's kind of like with Bam Bam Bigelow climb up on that top rope, you, or, or you didn't see a... 350-pound guy, 400-pound man, yeah, jump off that top rope. You didn't see that. Right. With me, Bam Bam, Bigelow, and, and a session of, with King Kong Bunny were the same way. You know, you didn't see a big man like him that could bump and move like that. Right. I mean, he was very agile uh, in the ring. So if you had something that was, uh, that defied uh, logic. See, when I throw a drop kick, it defied logic. One guy told me, one time I told him, I said, he said, you know what the most impressive thing about you? I said, what, my press slam? He said, no, no. He said, with them big arms, we expect you. But we don't expect you to have a high drop kick. We didn't expect you to leapfrog. They didn't expect you to get up that high. Well, not a muscle man, because yeah. we was always labeled being muscle bound. You understand? Low gravity. Low gravity. So that's why Puskett, Puskett never left his feet. Superstar bit of ground never left his feet. That's the image that was presented when he got a muscle man in the ring. Mm -hmm. Ultimate Warrior never threw a drop kick. No. Hulk Hogan never threw a drop kick. No, didn't need to. Not that he didn't need to, he couldn't do it. He couldn't even physically couldn't, do it. They, they didn't have to do it, and and I didn't have to do it. But you but did I, it. I, yeah, because uh, Terry Funk got me to doing that stuff. Did he? Terry Funk. He said, if you want to overshadow all the other muscle men, he said, instead of trying to do it with your body, why do you do stuff that they don't do? Something different. Do, yeah, be a wrestling baby face, yeah. he told me. He said, learn how to drop kick. And the guy that uh, got me, that taught me to drop kick was Steve Kern. Steve Kern, really? Steve he taught Kern. you the drop kick? Yeah, Steve how Kern. How did he teach you the drop kick? Well, every, uh, they, they had, uh, in Charlotte, they had what they called the Park Center, where they had matches uh, every Monday night. Mm -hmm. So I used to have to come to the show earlier every show early to work out in the ring with him. And that's how they used to do it. They didn't have wrestling schools then. Mm -hmm. So if you want to learn something, the guy said, well, kid, you know, the show back in the old days, you start at 8 o'clock. So you just get to the building early before they start letting the fans in, mm -hmm. and they would take you in the ring and work with stuff with you. Mm -hmm. Certain guys. And that's how they did it. There was no wrestling school. So Steve Kern was the guy that uh, taught me to drop kick. Skip Young was the guy that taught me how to leapfrog. Mm -hmm. And the hit butt off the top rope, or the second rope from Harley Race, he did it first. He showed you how? Yeah, but he did a diving one. I did a, a jumping one. one. Really? Yeah, he would stand and fall just like a tree, stiff. Harley? Harley Race, yeah. yeah. You never see him do oh, it? Oh, I saw him do it. Yeah, but, but he was like, like a tree falling. And man was kind of, I jumped from the second rope up and down. Oh, I didn't so see I, I didn't want, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I did a diving hit, but when you was down on the ground. Right. You know, when you're down, and I come down and headbutt you from the, from, from the floor. I would jump up and headbutt you. Yeah, Harley Race taught me that.
Yeah. Tony, let me ask you this. When you initially came into WWWF to start these television tapings, did you have any expectations on how and when you were going to be used by the WWWF no. and Vince no. Did he give you any kind of idea what he they wanted no, to do it wasn't about you? him. Who was it about? With Vince Sr., it was about the people. So he He's, wanted the fans to determine what they, they were going did. to do with you. Okay. They did. He didn't have to want it. That was with every wrestler. What was your initial impression of him when you met him? Well, well see, this is how he didn't tell you things. When I first went to Washington, the Capitol Center, yeah, in Washington, in, in Hanover, Landover, Maryland, and Baltimore, both buildings were sold completely out. And they went ape shit for you. Captain Lou Albano came to me that day. He said, we had never sold this building out since I've been here. Wow. And they attributed that to that as part of you? Salisbury, Maryland, they didn't even run. I opened up Salisbury, Maryland. Uh, West Virginia, uh, Angelo Savoli booked me and SD, the B car. We sold out Fall Rubber and all the Cape Cod. And Andrew Wilson voted said, all I need is Tony Atlas, and I would sell out anything with Tony Atlas. Wow. That's what he said. That's what makes them put you on top. Nothing else. If you could put asses in the seat, you're on top. But what Vince did, he took that away. And he made the company the star. And the reason he done that, because in those days, they used to call it wrapping the territory around one guy. Mm -hmm. So like Bruno Sammartino, if he's the main, if he's the man, people didn't pay to see WWL. They paid to see Bruno. When Huckamania was running wild, people did not pay to see WWL. They paid to see Huck Hogan. Right. When, when they ran WWF, they didn't pay to see WWF. They, uh, they paid to see Tony Atlas or the Wild Samoan or whoever was the big name at that time. Mm -hmm. Everything was based on that person. You see what I'm saying? Yep. When I went to another territory, they wanted to see Abdullah the Butcher. They came to see Abdullah. He was the headliner. They came there to see King Kong Bruiser Brody. Now... They go to see WWE. There's no more movie stars, and there's no more main eventers. You have your main eventers, your semi-main eventers, and your preliminary guys. Now you don't have preliminary guys. You don't have semi-mainers. Now you got what they call uh, WWE superstars. By doing it that way, everybody's on the same level. Everybody's a superstar. Right, everybody's a superstar. So when you get rid of one, the houses still go. See, one of my things, what I didn't know in my day, I didn't show up for a building one time. And uh, the promoter tell me, said, when we put you on top, people pay to see you, not the show, but you. You the drawing card. Mm. You're like you take Michael Jordan. He was the drawing card. Uh, Larry Bird. People didn't pay to see the Celtics. They paid to see Larry Bird. Right. When they went to boxing, they didn't care who Muhammad Ali was fighting. They wanted to see Muhammad Ali. Right. When they went with Tyson was fighting, they wanted to see Mike Tyson. When Elvis Presley walked on stage, they didn't want to see a concert. They want to see Elvis. So the territory was wrapped around one guy. We gave that guy a lot of power, especially during Bruno San Martino time. Mm -hmm. You know, he had a lot of say-so, even though he was not part of the company. But he was the guy that they have to cater to because he was the guy that put asses in the seat. The same with Hulk Hogan. Once Hogan got big, and then they started putting everybody on the same level. Right. And when one get too high, they would bring him down a little bit and pull somebody else out. Right. Give you a prime example. A big and as popular as John Sr. are. Have you known they can leave him off the TV? Sure. And, and people don't miss him. Yeah. Well, they no, miss him, but... No, nah, no, nah, they move on. It's like all the sight, all the man. 
Now imagine they're doing that to him in 1980. Would have been devastating. It would have been devastating yeah. to the company. Now anybody could walk away from that, and they won't miss him. Because it's not about the rest of Vince reversed that scenario. He made it all about the company. He made it all about the company and not the rest of it. I watch guys go on and leave all, all day long. The company never miss a beat. But back in the day, if uh, Bruno didn't show up, or Hogan didn't show up. Bad night. Or, or Stone Cold Steve Austin didn't show up. Yep. Or Bret Hart didn't show up. You would almost had a riding on your hand. Now, if Bret Hart get fired, if he was, you know, if a wrestler get fired today. They drug their shoulders. Maybe upset for a day or two. All right. Oh, he's gone. Who you got next? Who's coming next? Now, let me ask you this, Tony. Take us back in time to the first time you met with Vince McMahon Sr. What was your impression of this man? Gentleman. He was a gentleman. Was Perfect he jingling gentleman. his quarters? Only when he's nervous. Only when he's nervous he uh, jingled. didn't like something, yeah. Really? Yeah. Did really he ever like jingle it. with you? Many times. Well, you made him <laughs> nervous? Uh, many times. Why would he jingle the quarters with you? I just did different stuff that, that just shocked him, you know. He, he could never figure me out, you know. I had this uh, this ego problem, mm -hmm. you know. I was just too strong. When you get left a 450-pound man over your head, it's very hard to control that person. Do you think Vince McMahon Sr. tried to control you? No, he never tried. I never had no problem with him. He My was good to you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he understood me. He, he pulled me to the side, talked to me several times about things, you know. But really, no, no problem at all with, with him. Would it resonate with you when he'd pull you aside? Would oh, you try yeah. and change to accommodate oh, yeah. what Vince well, that's McMahon what I was Sr. Used to. wanted? Yeah. It wasn't just him. Ole Anderson would do that. Bill Watts would do that. Every promoter I ever met would do that except for Vince Jr. Can you remember anything specifically that maybe Vince Sr. had a problem with that he pulled you aside for? No. Matches or just substance the, problems yeah, you might have yeah, had? Or? No, no, no. I didn't have a something problem then. That was after the fact. After, that was after Vince yeah, Sr. Yeah, my, my drug problem got bad after my wrestling career. Feet? Did Vince Sr. ever have to talk to you about feet? No, he didn't even know about it. He didn't even know? Oh, all right. Well, mm -hmm. you, can you think of any instance why see, he, he might have boys, had a problem with you? Well, when you, when you see the boys was different back then. Yeah. If you go to tell the promoter anything, mm -hmm. you're stooge. Right. That's why we was able to do a lot of stuff that Vince, Vince Jr. didn't even know. It said 2009. About the shows. 2009 when he found out. I was surprised by that. Yeah, yeah. He did not know. And he was impressed. Yeah, but he, but what shocked me, he didn't know. I showed him pictures of a girl standing on my face. He said, oh, man, this is some cool shit. I didn't know you was into this. <laughs> didn't know. Do you think he asked Linda to do it to him when he went home? I don't know about Maybe. all that. But what, I, but what I did know was this. In the olden days, if you go to tell the promoter anything, a foot fetish or anything, I, we were the type of guys in our day, what said in the car, stayed in the car. Right. What happened in Vegas, stay in Vegas. That was wrestlers. It was a code. It was a code. And if it got back to the office, then you ain't riding with me no more. Because you, if you tell Vince about my shoe fetish, what else you going to tell him about me? Right. So the, the, the boys would, they had what they called clicks. They had certain guys that they would hang out with that they trusted. And if they didn't trust it, like I just give you a quick story how it was. I was in uh, Georgia Championship Wrestling, and Ric Flair came in to work a little angle with me. You've probably seen it on TV. Well, he ain't supposed to be riding me anyway, but the guys left him. So I'm on a ride with a wrestler called Don Canota. And uh, Flair said, look, can you take me to the town? Drop me, when we get to the town, drop me off at uh, like a 7-Eleven or something. And he said, I would take a taxi then to meet the guy. Mm -hmm. He said, I got to meet the guy up there. Uh, I said, okay. And he said, who you got with you? And it was this 77 or 78, how I know, because I was driving a 77 Lincoln Town car. Mm -hmm. So the car I had was a brand new 77. So it was 77. I want to say 77. But anyway, I said, I'm riding with Don Canuto. He said, well, if you go with him, I found another way. And I said, why is that? 
He said, Tony, you already on top. You got your position. He said, that guy is on bottom, and what he wants is your, is my job. He said, I don't ride with undercar guys because if I say something or do something, they're going to want to try to get browning points with the, with the boss, and they're going to go back and brag and talk about everything I do. And that made sense for some And he would not ride with a guy that was on the undercar. Mm -hmm. he, said, he said, if Canuda is going to be with you, he said, then I can't go. And he didn't. Well. Because I didn't want to kick Canuda out the car. You stayed loyal to Don. Well, he was looking for, see, the, a lot of guys didn't make a lot of money. Right. Uh, back in them days. And uh, if they could catch a ride with somebody that would pay, that would, you know, give them to the show, get them back for the show, and they don't have to spend no money and, and this and that. And most of the top guys, when we stop to buy beer, I buy his beer. We stop to get food, I pay for his food. Cost him nothing to go to the show. Right. Because he was not going to get as much. It was a spot show. He wasn't going to get as much as, as I was. So so it was nice, you know. And that's what a lot of guys did, you know. And if you make a little money, you pay what you call trans. If you make it, you know, pretty decent you money. Sent they would a uh, Right. They would charge you trans. But uh, Flair got left behind because the guys had to leave. And Flair showed up late, and he didn't have a, a ride there. Mm -hmm. and he didn't have a car because we were going from what he flew in from uh, from uh, uh, Charlotte. He was working in oh, Charlotte. Oh, I see. This was in Georgia, so the guy was leaving at a certain time. And evidently, Flair didn't show up for the ride. He got stuck at the hotel. <laughs> so he, I was running late. No surprise. No surprise. I was running late. He happened to see me, asked me for a ride. But I think he went to the airport and got a rental car and drove up. But he would not ride with me with Canuda in the car because Canuda was the undercar guy. And he said, that guy is dangerous to have around me. Wow. He tried to warn you, too? Yeah, because what happened, Canuda is trying to work his way up the ladder. Right. So if Vince come and say, hey, I hear Ric Flair roll with you guys. And he said, well, what did he talk about? Well, you know, this guy, see, this is an opportunity to get in good grace with the boss. Right. So he's going to tell everything I say, everything I do, you know, he's going to, he's going to tell the boss. See? And, and Flair knew that. See, when the guy in the top position said, hey, what did Rick Flair tell you? Oh, man, I was drunk half the time. I don't remember what he said. See what I'm saying? Yeah. I don't have to scratch and claw my way to the top. I'm already on the top. Right. And that's one of the things that I remember about would have changed a lot in the business. And it's still that way with a lot of guys. Yeah. Like Kane tried by himself, Mark Henry tried by himself, Ted Long tried by himself. There's still a lot of wrestlers right now today that were not tribal with another wrestler. I bet you Miz is one of them. Miz? I bet you, I don't know for sure, but I'm almost willing to bet he tried by himself. Why? So that nobody know nothing about him. But why would you just say Miz out of everybody on the roster right now? Because of his position. All right, well, and as this episode goes along, Tony, the fans wanted to know, how did you see things change once Vince McMahon Sr. sold the company to his son? We'll call him Vince McMahon, Sr. For the na uh, Vince McMahon Jr. for the nature of this episode, the Vince McMahon that most fans know and either love or hate see, today. See, what was the transition like, Tony? Well, you see, Vince... Is not into wrestling. Yeah. He's into entertainment. Mm -hmm. Remember that first he's wanted to do that TNA, TNT yeah, program? The talk show, yeah. Yeah, the, the na na's and the music and all, all this stuff. He always wanted to be in the entertainment business. He never was, wrestling was, to him was going to be a stepping stone into something bigger and better. Didn't work out that way. It worked out better than what he thought, but even now, even now, I bet you dollars to donuts. I don't, not that familiar with with what's going on now, that he's probably looking to get back into bodybuilding or football. Well, the football league XFL restarts next year. See what I'm saying? Yeah. He tried everything he could from day one to get out of the wrestling business and into the entertainment business. He wanted to be an entertainment company. He don't want to be bothered down with wrestling. I don't even think he likes wrestling. You don't think he enjoys it at all? No. No. What because it's something he always wanted to do in his in his youth and his father prevented him from doing that. So he resents it. He had a he had a resentment towards wrestling. He don't like wrestling. I'm ready to bet dollar donut that I don't know for sure, 
I'm just guessing, that Vince Jr. don't like wrestling. If he did, he wouldn't be trying to get out of it every time you turn around. I'm going way back in the in the in the eighty with JYD was uh was there during that time with mm -hmm. Big Boss Man and all that. Mama yeah. he, would, he would done all the reality stuff. Yeah. You know? He always wanted to do that. Then he started the bodybuilding stuff. Then he tried to get into football league. He wanted to get into everything but wrestling. He told me out of his own mouth it was up to him. He would just do pay per views and uh uh TV tapes. TV yeah. tape it. He said not that. And he said he only do he said he only do the house shows to keep the boys busy. He didn't care less about the house shows. He make his money up pay per view and TV. Right. He don't care about them house shows. When you started with the company at because that Because in the in the day, if a terror like let's say you come to Portland, yeah. man, and it don't sell out. You would try to work to get that town going. Why he don't do that? He only runs them once a year or so. A lot of those. He cities. don't care. Yeah. That if it draws or not, he only booking it to keep the board busy. And a lot of times he get mad if a town do draw. I learned that long time ago, because we came up here with on the B team. We had an A team and a B team, right? Mm -hmm. So we come up here. Andrews devoted. I mean, uh, the Andrews was dead. But was not doing it no more. It was a, he had another agent then, Sergeant Jacques Goulet. Mm -hmm. was the agent, and uh, the town drew, and he was mad about it. And I asked, asked him, I said, why do you get mad if the, if the town draw? He said, well, they run it this town tonight, and if this town don't draw, he could use this town for a write-off, and then this town over here is a town, and he don't have to pay taxes on the big show. Makes sense. So he would run yeah. a small show, and put guys on that he don't want to pay no money to. <laughs> but we sold the bill out. Me and OSD, he didn't like that. He didn't like that at all. And that's why I found out that he would run a, a B team. The, the B team, they don't want the B team to draw. That put him in a different tax bracket. Yeah. So let us say he got $100,000 on this show, and over here he got $100,000. That's $200,000 he got to pay tax on. But if he only draw... Fifty thousand dollars, then he could write that whole thing off. Right. So the hundred thousand dollars he may go ahead. He ain't got to pay no taxes over. Everything is how not to pay. That's why he got one of the commissioners. Yeah, yeah. But with the gate tax, right. the licenses, and all that stuff, mm -hmm. he didn't want to pay that no more. When you first met the man, he was the commentator on the WWF TV shows. What were your initial impressions of meeting? Vince McMahon Jr. for the first time, long before he was ever the owner of the company. I didn't have any oppression. You never thought anything we of We never, him. yeah, the old timers didn't. The only thing we thought, thought about was our job. I was not a commentator. I never thought about it. I was not the promoter. You I never said hello. You never had a conversation. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah we did yeah. that stuff. And what did you mean, think of him? He was, I still, I like Vince. Yeah. All we did. I always liked the Vince. I have no problem with Vince. I miss him in the Hall of Fame. You missed him? No, I mentioned him. Oh, mentioned him. Yeah, I gave him credit and my wife for saving my life. Because if he hadn't called back to Saba Simba, I would have never got another chance. Fair enough. So I have no, you know, I, I never really thought about him. Was it a different atmosphere in the company when the son bought the company from the dad? Of New course. New boss in charge? Of what course was it, it like, is. Tony? Well, Junior... The best person to ask that question to would be somebody white. Why is that? Because he didn't talk to us. He didn't talk to you. Yeah, you got well, as a black man, what was the difference to you? The two no difference. They didn't talk to blacks. <laughs> no, I mean, what was the difference like working there? It was, the same, it was the same as everyone else. Well, you just we, said a minute ago there was a difference. Which well, one is it? Was it? A different, the only difference was that when you fucked up, uh, the old promoters would let you know. Mm -hmm. With the McMahon, you could fuck up and you would never know. That was the difference. And I said that 101 times. But being a black man, my mom used to always tell, tell me, stay out of white folks' business. They didn't socialize with us. Mm -hmm. The only time they talked to us was when they wanted us to do something. They were the same with Junkyard Dog, the same with me. 
Same with Rock and Jones. You ask any black wrestler from that time, they did not talk to us. Did you enjoy the atmosphere with one over the other? Or was it similar? The only thing that was different, like I keep repeating over and over, the only thing that was different, if you did something wrong, Vince, other promoters will let you know the big man will never do that. You don't know if you're doing good or if you're doing bad. They would never do that. Personally, when you did got you like fired, one over the other? When you got fired, you keep, you're going to get the same answer. All right. You're going to get the same answer. You like Vince Sr. and Jr. equally? Yeah, because No they, more, no less. Yeah, 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 yeah. No matter how many times you ask the, ask the question, you're going to get the Who same answer. Who was better with the payoffs, father or son? They're about the same. They're about the, really? I thought you said yeah. the payoffs kind of... Uh, Based upon what you were drawing, were a big disappointment. Wait, under. see what happened with what happened with with, with, uh, with with Junior. He just put everybody on contract, so it didn't matter if you drew or not. With Vince Senior, you have to draw. With Vince Junior, you don't have to. Well, I thought they were contracts, but at the same time, not with Senior, there was. It wasn't. was still incentive based based upon the percentage of the not, gross. Not not with Senior, there was no contract. It was a hand. No, right with Senior, no, but right. with Vince McMahon Junior, once contracts contract. come into play. You were contracted to X amount of TV tapings per year. It had nothing right. to do with how much money. Yeah, you got the same amount of money, not a penny less, not a penny more. So the, the boys don't really care about if it draw or not. They're going to get the same I'm money. I'm talking about in the, the mid-1980s, Tony, not when you went back in 2008 for the uh, Mark Henry run. In, t in the mid-1980s, you were given a contract to lock you into the company. Right. But the, you were based upon primarily how much each live event generated. You were given a percentage. With senior. And with junior. Not so much with junior. You're trying to tell me you were not paid a, a percentage in the mid-1980s? No. How were you paid in the mid-1980s? With, with, with junior. Right. With, when junior took over, it was, it was guarantees. You had guaranteed money mm -hmm. in the mid-1980s. Yeah. You sure about that? Yep, I'm positive. Really? With junior, not with senior. I understand that. With, with Junior, yeah. Because when he called me back from AWA, he sat me down and told me what I'm going to be getting every year. Yep. That's how they got guys in the territory. They didn't say they were WCW. Sheik went down there for 175000 and and worked one time. And the Sheik went paid. down for ridiculous money in yeah. the late 1980s. And yeah. then what's yeah. even better was there was a rollover Junior the, the one that started. Year. Junior the one that started all the contracts and all the guarantees. No, there was no guarantee before. Uh, uh, what some guys were getting, like Rocket Johnson, was getting a fifteen hundred dollar a week guarantee with uh, 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 Eddie Graham in Florida. Mm -hmm. And they had a few promoters did it, but it wasn't as rampant. And when Vince took over, when Vince took over, everything was contract. A lot Vince, of the, Vince, the one that brought the contracts into. From the, what I recall, the guaranteed contracts in WWF didn't begin until nineteen ninety six after Hall and Nash left. No, because. Because because I had a I had a contract with, with Vince as Saba Simba. For guaranteed money. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. Are you sure about I'm, that? I'm positive. Absolutely. I lived it. All right. Positive. Well, that's we they learned. They may not have did it across the board. Mm-hmm. Cause when Hogan came in, he came in on a guarantee. Hogan did. Even his years fluctuated with what he made. So how could you say there was a guaranteed contract well, he came if you're making a different yeah, no, amount when of money? Hogan, when, when Hogan came back, well, it fluctuated because the way they did with a lot of guys that they liked, let's say he promised you 100000 but you may make 150 mm -hmm. or you may make 200 mm -hmm. but you guarantee that certain amount. They, they had guarantee guaranteed with, uh, with a lot of guys. They didn't do it with everybody. Mm -hmm. Now it's... Just the only thing they have changed, they just did it across the board. You know, Rocket Johnson had a guarantee in the 70s. So in the 1980s with WWF, just one more time, you had a contract guarantee for more than just 17 TV that's how he got you. That's how they get you to come back. That's how they get you to run, to leave one territory. That's how they got Junk Y'all Dog to leave Bill Watts. That's how they got all these guys to leave where they was at. Why are they going to come there? For They're the, making the money. Dog would money. make a dog would yeah. make it over hundred grand at, at, at home every night. So what would make JYD leave Vince? Vince promised him more money. That's how Vince did it. 
I didn't think there were dates and financial numbers put that's in those contracts. That's how he did but that's how he did it. That's right, how, well. But that's how he got everybody to, 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 to leave where they to was leave at. leave their home they territory. Was, they was yeah. making money. At most time, they was over like a million dollars. Kurt Hannon was making good money in the AWA. He had no reason to leave. JYD was hotter than a firecracker down in Louisiana. Vince called him up and guaranteed him a certain amount of money every year. <laughs> he did it. That's how he stole all the people from all these different territories. With a guarantee, he would guarantee you that you make this amount of money. Hmm. Whether you draw or not. So I mean, how can someone say no to that? How do you think that jumped y'all dog to leave uh, the Bill Watts? Well, the only I guy think he also knew potentially with the company that was expanding nationally based out of New York City, there was going to be a greater potential for dog him to make a lot more know that. Money. He didn't know that. No, dog. How can anyone how would with dog the brain that? not realize there was more money to be made at WWF out of New York than some shit down in Louisiana in the middle of nowhere? We he, we knew not a damn thing about WWF. You keep forgetting was not the biggest drawing territory in the world then. But what the, was in the mid '80s? Well, well, but when when dog and them went there. Dog was making good money in Georgia. WCW was doing real good. They still had places where you could make good money. Sure, in the absolutely. Business. I'm not right, disputing right. that. Right, right. places. But you see, what you got to look at, we got our information in the 70s and in the 80s right. from wrestling magazines. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like it is now. Y'all looking at it now. All this stuff came about in the nannies with the internet and all this and that stuff. We didn't even have cell phones then. Dog had no freaking idea what went on in the WWF at that time. None. He, he would there. have no idea that he could make None more money out of New York no. than he could out no, of Louisiana. No, no, we he did had not. no idea about None. that. The, the boy, the boy, the boy went to, you can, see what you try to do, you try to, try to take a man that never been nowhere in the rest of the world but Tennessee and Louisiana. In Calgary. And try to put the knowledge of your, uh, 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 figure that he knew all this. He did not know until he got there. I did not know until I got there. We knew what we hear. Mm -hmm. But you didn't know for sure. But how? You couldn't. There was no, yeah, how? All right. It wasn't like it is now. You the know, information didn't flow as freely. No, 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 no. We didn't. We just worry about our territory. We worry about where we was at at that time. We didn't worry about what some guy was making up in New York. Were you happy with what you made there as opposed to other companies? Oh, yeah, you yeah. Were. It oh, was yeah. good. Oh, yeah, yeah. But uh, Georgia was the best. Georgia, you made more in Georgia than WWF. Yes. And why do you think that is? You're you home every night. No you hotel, didn't have as many expenses. No hotel, no rent a car, no plane, no expenses. You home every night. Not even meals. And in I was some making cases. between seventy-five to eighty thousand dollars a year, and I was home every night. And go to WWF for a hundred thousand dollars a year, and spend it fifty thousand to make the show. Right. You're on the road constantly with WWF. No, I knew nothing about Vince. I didn't know nothing about Vince until I went there. Knew I knew nothing about Tennessee until I went there. The Goulises? I mean, we knew about things from hearing it from other wrestlers. They would tell us stories about what happened in their territory and what they're doing and what they this and that, 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 that. But we didn't know. Fair we didn't enough. know. If you didn't know, you didn't know. If guys knew, they would not have stayed in these little bit ass territory as long as they did if they knew. They would have headed for the they doors. They would have headed a long they time ago. They would have headed for the exits. Long time ago. Long time ago. Why do you think Rick Flair stayed in Charlotte for so long? You know, if he knew that Vince was going to be the biggest he was, he would have left WCW. If he knew, like Paul Ondorff and all them guys, when they left Vince and ran to WCW, and then Paul Ondorff go to work when they the damn doors a lot. If he had known that, you think he would have went to WCW? <laughs> Sometimes no. you have to use a little conversation with a little conversation with these things. No, them guys didn't know. They were with another Vince call you up and offer you more money. Guaranteed money. And you say, oh shit. I ain't gonna pass this up. How could you? <laughs> you couldn't. Well, how do you think he got all the top talent from around the world if there was no guarantee? I thought it was a promise that could either be kept no, but or now, not kept. But now it's across the board. That's the only thing that changed. 
Everybody get one now. A contract, you mean? A, a contract right. and a guarantee. Downside Everybody guarantee. get it now. That's the only thing that changed. Back then, it was guys that he wanted that he would give a guarantee. He'd make the big promise. Oh, right, like Ted gotcha. DiBiase. He would, he, would, he would give him a guarantee. Or he would give a junk y'all dog a guarantee. But a Johnny Ross, he didn't give him no guarantee then. But he would get one now. Everybody gets them. Everybody, Everybody gets them. That. That's all that have changed. That's all that have changed. Yes, I got guarantees in many places. All right, fair enough, wrestling fans. Japan. Right? Oh. We went to Japan. Japan was always known for the always, guarantee. They would guarantee you. You knew what you was getting before you got off the airplane. No matter what the house did, you was guaranteed a certain amount of money for the time you was there. So guarantees are nothing new. It just everybody didn't get one, and now they do. That's all they have changed. All right, wrestling fans, we're going to take a brief time out. We'll be back with the second half of the show. Stand by. Have a sip, Tony. Phoenix. On Monday, September 30th, Monday Night Raw returns with an epic battle. You're looking at your new universal champion. Well, I got news for you. I am the champion around here. As Seth Rollins and Baron Corbin collide for the Universal Championship. Plus, see the man Becky Lynch, Braun Strowman, and the Fiend Bray Wyatt. It's WWE Raw live in Phoenix Monday, September 30th. Tickets and ringsider packages are available. The irresistible force meeting the immovable object. We're friends, Andre, please. Maybe you'll believe this, Hogan. the bottom line. Neither of these superstars is leaving this match without a few scars. The story will end with me becoming the Universal Champion. I don't think I've ever seen two more evenly matched competitors in my life. WWE's Greatest Rivalries, available on live or wherever books are sold. It's the 20th anniversary of WWE SmackDown Live. The party's just getting started with a blockbuster event featuring Hulk Hogan, Sting, and Brock Lesnar. Plus, no one rises above the Viper. We are trying to save the entire tag team division. Not a single team in all of WWE that is better than the New Day. The New Day battles Randy Orton, Daniel Bryan, and Rowan in a six-man tag team match. SmackDown Live's 20th anniversary comes to you live from Los Angeles Friday, October 4th. Tickets are available. Wrestling fans, welcome back to the September edition of Memories and Legends. I'm Dan Marotti and my buddy, my sidekick, my comprende, Mr. USA, Tony Atlas. Tony, we have an, another interesting discussion in professional wrestling annals. The McMahon family, the McMahon yeah. clan, as Gary Michael Capetta called them. Another one of your, your partners in crime that introduced you to the ring many times. We talked about Vince McMahon Sr. and Jr., one of the uh, more, I wouldn't say forgotten about, but less spoken of members of the McMahon family that certainly meant a lot to the company as it started its national expansion was Linda McMahon, Tony. Did you ever have any kind of interactions with Mrs. McMahon now, a, a high roller in Washington, D.C.? No. Never? Never. Did you ever say hello to the woman? Maybe one. You only spoke to Linda McMahon one time? Yeah. When you worked with the company, what was your understanding of what Mrs. McMahon did? Don't know. You had no I'm being honest. You had no clue I what she did. I spoke to her once. I say hi. She say hi. That was it. Wasn't she at all the TV tapings? I don't know. You don't even know? I don't know. What was your impression of her in that one meeting that you had with her? I didn't have one. The one, t <laughs> the one time you said hello to her, what did you think? How much you can get from a hi? Are you impressed with where she's gone from leaving WWE to go into the world of politics. I know you followed politics closely. If you're working for it, yeah. Yeah. But I don't know the woman. When you heard that Donald Trump was interested in bringing him into the cabinet, what did you think of that? A lady that you kind of worked for indirectly. I didn't think about it at all. You didn't think about it at all. <laughs> I don't believe that. Well, how, I don't believe that, Pot. Well, you're always thinking and you're always talking. Not about that. Nothing. You Nothing. didn't think anything about Linda McMahon when she got hired by Donald Trump. No, nope. only thing I worry about when Donald Trump got off here, what is he going to do for me? Not what Linda McMahon or anybody. Do you think Linda hired. McMahon could do anything for you? No. Nope. No. All right. What about Shane McMahon? I know you have a lot of respect for Shane. You've mentioned at different times. What are some of your earliest memories of Shane? Do you remember him as a kid running around the locker room, setting up the ring, 
and as a referee as he became a teenager and whatnot, leading into where he is now. Sure, he didn't really come around the show until until part of the nineties. The nineties. He, he got big. Yeah. yeah. He started coming to the show, traveling with the boys a little bit. But see, what is so hard for you to understand is a thing they call clicks. Right. When Shane was around, they had certain people that be around Shane and certain people couldn't be around Shane. And you weren't one of them. I'm black. Yeah. They don't hang out with blacks. Junkyard dog tried by himself. Me and Rocket tried by himself. The people I tried with in WWE were S.D. Jones and Rocket Johnson. What S.D. Jones and Rocket Johnson got in common? They wrestled. There's one more thing that got in common. I understand where you're going That's with that. How they were it black, was. Right? Nobody want to accept that. There is clicks. That's why Vince, when he did Legend House, he put me in with Hillbilly Jim, <laughs> uh, Howard Finkerton, Pat Patterson, and you watch it real close. And when they ask each wrestler, they ask each wrestler, what was the most memorable thing about being in Legend House? Mm -hmm. they, and Piper, Hacksaw, Tony Atlet, they all gave the same answer. It gave us, this is the first time that we got to know each other. And you like that? It's not so much likely, it did, you're missing the point. All of these guys have been in the business for years. And they didn't know each other personally. I understand that. Bob. Because we didn't travel together. Right. We, was a, we saw each other in the dressing room. And a lot of these guys, you work 300 shows have, with a year, and you knew healed, nothing about them. When it, the only time that I even socialized with Hacksaw was in the ring. They had heel dressing room. In the mid eighties and nineteen in the mid eighties WWF they were heel and baby face locker mm -hmm. rooms. Yeah. The where they didn't socialize with me. I sat in the room with Big Boss Man a thousand or a hundred times. I he never said two words to me. Until you talked to him on that independent show in Tennessee. That was the first that time he ever talked. The first time me and Hacksaw ever talked was at Legend House. Piper didn't have shit to say to me. Never. But he spoke highly of you in his book. But no, but he never said nothing to me. Hmm. Never. Well, Shane was around more in the run you had with Mark Henry. What did you think of him as an adult in 2008 when you went back? The same thing. He didn't talk to me. Nothing. You never. No, why you, should he? Well, you said he was a tough guy. How did you know he was a tough guy? Because, because he grabbed me one day. And I felt his power. He grabbed you? Yeah. Why did he grab you? He wanted to see how strong I was. Really? Yeah. Now, when I was Saba Simba. Did he come yeah. at you from the it front, the same from night, The same night that kid got his neck broken. So that would have been Tampa, Florida in December of 1990. Night, that the okay. same night. Me and Shane, was, he came up from behind me, and Barbarian said, I would have let him take me down. I said, I didn't know it was him. And he told me, you almost broke my freaking arm. Who did? Shane told me that. So describe the scenario. You're in the locker room. And he grabbed me, he grabbed me around the waist. He tried and, to do like a like an amateur wrestling yeah, hold too? Yeah, and tried to take me down. And I <laughs> went around and I hooked his arm. I hooked his arm and I and I and I and I and I took him to the floor. I was gone after that too. Did you release him after oh, I, I you saw realized who it was? Who it was. Yeah. Yeah. Of course I did. Now was he laughing at that point? No. His his eyes were bloodshot, he was pissed off at the mother. He was mad at you. Yeah, yeah. But what did he expect you to do? Well, I don't think he expect what he got. He didn't think you were as strong as you were? Yeah. He yeah. thought Mr. USA was a work? Well, he, no, he didn't know that I was a collegiate champion, a Greco-Roman wrestler. He, he didn't, didn't know, know if you're wrestling that I could wrestle. That I could wrestle. I he see thought what I was just mean. another weightlifter that didn't know how to. He thought you were a Ted Icedi or something right, like that. Right, right. I he, see what he you didn't mean. Know, he didn't know that, that I was. I wrestled. I was a collegiate wrestler for 10 years. He didn't know all that. A lot of people aren't familiar with your they wrestling background. They don't background. know about my amateur And it's career. very impressive. Very yeah. impressive. Yeah. You were my a real deal wrestler. Yeah, I was a shooter. Yeah. A lot of people don't know that I was a shooter. Well, Shane learned the yeah. hard way, I yeah. guess. But getting back to what I was saying, yeah. see, that's why we, in Legend House, we all say, you watch the tape, you, you hear I you remember hear the guy, phrase. Yeah. Every guy say that, say, this is the first time that we're wrestling really got to know each other without working each other. Mm -hmm. Because the, the safest spot for a wrestler in my day was in the ring. Because mm -hmm. in the ring, you could protect yourself. The most dangerous, the most dangerous spot 
for a wrestler is in the car and in the dressing room. That's where careers are made and broken. Mm -hmm. George Scott tried to warn me. He said, when you ride with these guys, Tony, stay out of these conversations, these car conversations. He said, talk football, talk music, talk about women, mm -hmm. talk about anything but wrestling. Did you ever have non-wrestling conversations they have, with they have those type clicks. of people? Yeah. And certain guys would hang out. Like I tell you about the story about Don Canuda and, and Ric Flair. He wouldn't go around them guys. Flair had a certain group of guys that he would hang with. He hung around with uh, Paul Jones, Wahoo, Mulligan, and Dick Murdoch. It was only like three or four guys that Ric Flair in Mid-Atlantic would hang around with. Mm -hmm. Ole Anderson wouldn't hang around with nobody. Rufus R. Jones, tribe by himself. They laugh and joke in the dressing room, you know, but they, they had cliques. They had cliques. And you had to be part of that clique. The guys don't understand that. And even now, if you go back to, a, if you ever get a chance to go in the WWE locker room, you watch none of the guys talking to each other. It's different now than it was 20 years ago, 25 they years ago. They won't even talk to each other. They're not even cliques anymore. It is a, I, I don't know if professional is the word I'd use, but in, along the lines of, it's a very, That's right. they don't it's even a have much more no library more. type atmosphere. They, they don't even have cliques no more. They even, they even got rid of the cliques. And why do you think that is? Because somebody, like George Scott told me one time, I said, George, how do you know so much about me? He said, who you ride with? That's why Mark Henry hated the fact that I rode with him. Really? Yes. Why? Because I got to know things. Oh. See? I got to know things. You, I, never, I never told anything. You grew to become good friends with him, though. Yeah, because I never, he never heard it repeated. There's an old saying in the wrestling business, telephone, telegraph, and tell a wrestler. Teddy Long traveled by himself. Uh, King tried by himself. Now, a lot of the real top guys, they don't have to worry with the board. They got the bus. They got, <laughs> they got the bus, baby. They don't need those renter cars. See what They're point? traveling in style. Who do you think John Cena traveled with? Right. Well, I, I'm going to bite my tongue on that. But. Wrestlers, wrestlers, that uh, Mac Dog Bashan put it, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, and you want to get your bite out of it. So if a guy have a guarantee, no, Harley didn't know about it, because if Harley had found out about it, all the boys would know, all them going to want a guarantee. Right. All right, Tony. I'll tell you how I learned this real quick. Sure. Vince wanted me to put over Hercules Hernandez in Poughkeepsie, New York. August of 1986. Is that what it is? Yes. He was managed by Slick. Yep. I say, yes, I'm going to do it. Then I thought about it. I said, fuck it, I'm not going to do it. So Vince come out in the dress room, asked SD, said, where's Tony? SD said, he's in the car waiting for me in the car. He said, but he's on now. His match is in the ring. He said, I don't think he's going to wrestle Vince. So Vince McMahon come outside, sitting in the car with me. And he said, will you come back in, Tony? He said, do this for us. I promise I'm going to do something. We're going to, we're going to do, do an angle with you guys. So I walk back in the building with Vince. We go into the room. We started talking. And Vince told me about this idea and some things that he wanted to try with me. First, it was about a movie where I was supposed to get out of shape and come back and become champion with Hogan. So they're going to do a movie with Hogan. Mm -hmm. Even give me the strip. Then he turned around and told me something. He said, I got this other idea about a dying your hair blonde. T tell me all this stuff, right? And uh, we shook hands. He said, you going to do it? I said, yeah, I'll do it, Vince. He said, you sure? He said, I don't want to leave out here. I come in the car and get you. I said, no, I'm going to do it. We go to open the door. George, the animal, still had his ear up against the keyhole. Oh, okay. Vince turned and looked at me like that and walked away. I knew. From that point on, he can't do none of it. Why couldn't he have done it, though? Just because, because George Steele knew. Because I walked out of the dressing room, 
And everybody and knew I, that. I see what you mean. They all knew I walked out of the dressing room. Everybody else knew. Everybody else knew. Okay. And then Vince well, going to bring sense, me though. back and do all this nice yeah. stuff for me. That's going to make the other boys think Everybody they could, would do oh, it. Like the man, Sasha Banks episode we had. Th exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So Vince gave me this look like, I'm sorry, brother. And everything he told me, the movie went to Tony Tanner Lister, Lister. Zeus. And the blonde went to Butch Reed. But I, I knew about it. When you told me about that blonde head pot before in one of our phone conversations, mm -hmm. I thought at that point That's right. you might have wound up with the Butch Reed push because they'd never gone heel with you before. There, there was, was a lot was, of potential for you as a heel to work with well, some of those top do because I, Because I, I, I didn't fuck up none. Yeah. So what he wanted to do, that I get tired of being the good guy. I'm tired of being the good guy, being the pushed so over. So you get fucked over in the I match got with messed over and everything. And now I'm on a hill. That's what Vince was telling me. Yeah. But then guess who overheard the conversation? George Steele. And you didn't trust George Steele. No. That ain't the, but ain't, you didn't trust George no, no, Steele. I didn't know George Steele. But you don't trust him now. No, you're missing the whole point. All right. The boys know. Once the boys know, Vince can't do it. I understand that, part because, of it, but you didn't like because, George Steele. Be, because no, it ain't. It's not. I, I didn't know him well enough to like him or dislike yeah, him. Right. I, I know Bill Eady didn't like him. I know that Bill yeah, made a it lot very. Of the guys didn't like Bill, him. Bill made it very plain. But the point I was trying to make to you, I walked out of the dressing room. Vince came back and offered me a deal not to walk out on him right. again. Okay. I now understand that. Deal, that. He would have stuck to to that if it wasn't for Steele. If Steel. it wasn't for Steele, no. If Steele know the way Vince saw it. The, the other boy is going to know. Right. He told Mark Henry all the time, he said, there's a lot I would tell you if I thought you could keep your mouth shut. Vince said that to Henry? Many times. Now, was Henry known for having a I loose don't mouth? Know. I don't know. Really? I just, I'm just telling you what I hear that one day. Hmm. What happened between them? You don't know. I wasn't there. I wasn't there. I just tell you what I hear when I hear it. I tell you what I see when I see it. What happened before I hear it? What happened before I see it? I don't know. You don't know. I, don't, I wasn't there when when they when when Mark first came into territory. I don't know what Mark did before I got there or, or anything, but I do know that Vince got that. That's how the wrestling business is. When Vince tell you something, it got to stay between you and Vince. A junkyard dog used to always say, "You talk to the horse's head, not the horse's ass." There you go. It's a good way to put it. I like you that know. phrase. A telephone, telegraph, a telewrestler. If you tell one wrestler something, by morning, all the wrestlers know. So if, 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 if Vince let me come walk out on him in front of the boys, and then Vince come back and give me a big push, what do you think going to happen next week? Everybody else would do it. That's why They'd he couldn't do it. They'd all walk out. That's why he walked. He gave me that look like, like I'm sorry, that we can't do that now. And that's so now Vince had to make an example out of me. See the point? I got you. He got to let the other wrestler know that I that he that he can if he allow me to get away with doing that, then other wrestlers are going to expect the same thing. Right. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That's how the business works. So when Vince tells you something, the way he figure, if it, if he hear about it from another wrestler or from one of the stews, it's over. He can't be trusted. He, but well, he ain't, he can't do it now. Right. Right. You just shot yourself in the foot. See. All right. Well, Tony. That's the, that's how that's how the cup. I, I, the only, my only regret is that I didn't know that then. Right. I know these things now. That if now you could only I'm go not, back and do it again. Oh man, I keep my mouth shut. I will never be late. Cause that's the rule. You, it, it ain't a lot of rules to follow in wrestling. Mm -hmm. Keep your mouth shut. Do as you're told. And don't be late. Rules That's to it. live. Rules to live by. Three. Keep your mouth shut. Do as you're told, and don't be late. And I couldn't do none of them. But you're a hall I of famer keep, anyway. Imagine where you would have been if you did that. I'd have been a, a, a millionaire. A millionaire, or higher than that. But Tony, before we go, one more McMahon that we haven't discussed is a woman that you worked for in 2008 through 2010 uh, when she was a bigger part of creative than she is now, Stephanie McMahon. The you know I don't know nothing about that woman. You know nothing about Stephanie. Nothing about that Stephanie, nothing. You never had any kind of interaction with her. Nope. 
Except she, she thanked me for drawing her picture. That was about it. You drew her picture? I stayed away from that woman. But you drew her picture? Yeah, I stayed away from Triple H's wife. Well, she was in charge of creative. She never gave you care. direction? No, no. She never gave you direction of no, any kind? No. Really? No, no, no. Do you think she did a good job in her role? I think she did a hell of a job. Yeah. I think she's a very intelligent woman. I think she do a hell of a job. But I was Mark Henry manager. Right. She talked to Mark Henry, Mark Henry talked to me. Really? Yeah, that's how that worked. Hmm. So when you have your creatives or your sessions to I figure sat, out what was I going on? I in the corner and I was as quiet as that kid right there. He's a good man. I was just like him. So the way you see him doing, that's what I did. So, but we'll just say you were going to have a match. It wouldn't be a group of you together. She'd go specifically to Henry? Yeah, and don't Mark you, would tell me. Don't you think there'd be potential for the message to get miscommunicated? No. All right, no. so. You no, really don't have many thoughts about Shane, Linda, or Stephanie McMahon. Because they, You I, don't know them well. I don't know them. Would you like to get to know them? No. No, you don't really care at this point. <laughs> 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 no, but see, but this is hard for you to understand this. But that they, that left, that you talk about the wrestling world. Mm -hmm. You trying to put the wrestling world into the sport entertainment world. Mm -hmm. See, the wrestling world, the boys party, they got to drink, they got to right. screw, they got to do everything, they got to. A lot of guys lost their career because of that. Mm -hmm. But then when the entertainment business came along, it was different. It became different because uh, when you when you stop and look at the agents, there was uh, Arnold Scolan. Yeah, Scolan never stooge on nobody. Scolan pulled you aside, hey kid, get yourself in trouble with that. Uh, don't do that, kid. The new agent, hey Vince. See? So it became more and more uh, corporate. Business. Yeah, -like. yeah. they, they started yeah. tightening up on things a whole lot more. A whole lot more. And even back then, even with Vince Sr., the only person I tried with was SD. I didn't try with them other guys. They had nothing to uh -huh. say to me. And there was a lot of uh -huh. older guys back then anyway. Tony Guerrero, uh, Chief J. Strongbow, Jewel Strongbow. I mean, who in the hell I'm going to hang out with? They wouldn't have been a lot of fun, maybe. They're not a whole yeah. lot of fun, you know. The only old guy I tried with was Scolan because he liked to take SD with him and me for protection. He's he had the cash. He had the cash. He had the Halliburton with all the cash. With all the cash. That's right. This guy would come over. I'm a minute time. We drove him <laughs> on. We got $100,000, $150,000 in cash in a briefcase. In a freaking briefcase. Who did the driving? Uh, SD. And where were you, in the back? Yeah, I sat in the back of the school to set up front. <laughs> where was the Halliburton? With him, on with his that. lap. <laughs> it was a metal suitcase. That must have been a trusted man to walk around with that much company cash. Yeah, but SD was a freaking horse, brother. What do you mean? If you had met SD in his real life. I don't understand what you mean, he was a horse. He was a horse, brother. He well, was I heard you say it. We didn't want to fight. We didn't he was a tough guy. Boy, oh, really? Okay. I didn't know that. S.D. was a big fucking man, about 280 back then. Was man. he about your size? Or? S.D. Was, uh, he, was, he, was, he was pretty damn big. Yeah. I'll tell you about S.D. Jones. We, I, he used to work out with me. Mm -hmm. And uh, S.D. bench press over 400 pounds. Really? Yeah, he used to train with me. SD so he might not very, have been a world record setter, but he was a very he strong man. He was a very man. strong and yeah. big. He and was big. a lot thicker and bigger than people think he was. I remember him being a thick guy. He was yeah. very thick, but they had big, big, huge hands, big feet. I mean, when you saw him in real life, you're like, what the fuck? You know? He wasn't your typical undercard guy no. in 2019. And, 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 and he yeah. was deceiving looking in a way. He always looked smaller than what he was. Mm -hmm. But then you see him in person, you go, holy shit. Wow. I remember we walking down the street one day, people thought he was me. Really? Yeah, because he was so big and so wow. thick. Yeah, he was very thick, big hands, big feet. He was very thick, big, thick neck. Had, had, had no neck, you know, like, you know. He was a big, rugged, Tough rugged, guy, yeah. big, rugged guy. So when they saw me and SD walking, when, they, when SD was there, he was scolding bodyguard with that money. He was on every show with Scolan. Really? And the same thing with Andrew Savota. Let me ask you this, Tony, just to, to throw a, a random question out there. On the shows that Skolan couldn't go to to get the cash from the, you know, the gross of the night, who would do the opposite city? 
you know? There were none. In, in, what do you mean? New York, in, in New York, it was always stolen. In, 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 but with, there was with, often an A and a B team. Who would handle the opposite city? But that, it was it. But see, that's New York. Right. Anything in New York was stolen. The whole state of New York, it was in New York. See, every problem, like what the if there were two Monsoon, shows in New York? With, with New Jersey, Monsoon right. was the man in New Jersey. And then when you get to Philly, I mean, Pennsylvania and Merlin, it was a guy called Phil Zacco. Phil Zacco. Phil yeah. Zacco. And then when you got up around Boston, they had another guy that would be the Boston guy, and his name was Cookie or something like that. But Cookie? Massachusetts, yeah, Massachusetts had a had had a different guy that we used to work with, and then they had another guy that did a uh, Long Island. Uh, uh, Savoti had Long Island, and Maine. Mm -hmm. uh, Angelo Savoti. Yeah. So there was like, let me see, five or six guys, and they handled that area. Like Savoti only handled Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, and uh, Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. But there was another guy that did Boston. Cookie? We call him Cookie. I'm going to have to investigate that. Yeah. I don't know who I can't remember is. what his name was, but he was the man for the Boston oh, area. Interesting and enough. And then they did have Worcester that they used to do occasionally. But the main shows were Boston and uh, Springfield. Yeah. And once in a while, they would do Worcester or Lowell. Uh, stuff like that. Yeah. But they would like call spot shows, yeah. you know what I'm saying? But mainly the Boston was the main thing. They had a guy that ran Boston. They were, that was just his area. He used to always sit at the front door with suspenders on hmm. and smoke a big cigar, I remember. Abe I Ford? I can't remember his name? name that much, but I remember no. that was... We'll get it. Every, we'll get it. Don't every worry. state had a... Different, see, Scotland yeah. was the one with the license. Then the McMahon, at that time, they only had uh, Connecticut. They ran Connecticut along with another uh, guy. Uh, they probably were using his license there. That was uh, Tony Atomo. Mm -hmm. and he did the Connecticut. Whenever we did, did Connecticut, Tony Atomo was always yeah. there as the, as the agent mm -hmm. in Connecticut. Then New York with Scotland. Every New York show was on the Scotland. But we got around the Garden, the Five Borough, then Monsoon, all of them was there for the, you you. Know, for the big show. Yeah. And then New Jersey was uh, Monsoon. Monsoon would come up with that big briefcase with that 45 in it. Oh, he had it in the case. Oh, yeah. Really? All right. The big old 45 music game. All right. Well, whatever that thing was. But but that's how it was. What it was, it was different promoters that got together yeah. to make one company. And that's why Vince ain't never worrying about. Do like that organization you keep talking about with all the millions and millions of dollars? AEW. Not going to make it. All right. Well, that's a different story for different episodes. Well, I'm going to tell you real quick right, why real they ain't going to make it. Because they can't promote these towns. They put something on the internet. They withdraw for a while. But there's hundreds and hundreds of people don't know about them. They got nobody in Massachusetts to promote Massachusetts for them. They got nobody in Maine to promote Maine. Vince, when he got started, he had those people. He had Regional them people, people to do yep. the world. Yeah, I get what you mean. They, they, they may come along once in a while and make a big splash at the beginning, but they're not going to last because there's nobody to build that foundation in these territories. If they really want to make it work, instead of trying to do pay-per-views and big shows now and then, big show there, what they do, they should put the boys to work, like Vince Jr. Sr. did, mm -hmm. put them to work, in territory, like for example, you you here in Massachusetts, so they should call you up and say, "Look, we'd like for you to be our promoter and agent, mm -hmm. promote our shows in Mass." So every time they come here, you be the guy in charge of of of, of, of the Boston area. Mm -hmm. So you be responsible for the the bookings get out for this to be done, and they would send you guys to work, and the guy would come and work for you. Yeah. Okay. See what hurt these guys. These companies don't keep the boys busy. Right. So you put a guy on what that company is named? That AEW. AEW. Well, he working for the AEW this week. What are you doing Monday? What are you doing Tuesday? Yeah. What are you doing Wednesday? And then all of a sudden, some independent promoter call him up and say, hey, he's on that independent show. Right. You understand what I'm saying? Well, they're going to have structured exclusive contracts, so they're not going to have that 
problem to worry about. Yeah, but but the point is they don't have they have to create the territory. To they don't them. have local people. I see what you're right, saying. Right, yeah. right. Where where would a guy come and, and work for you tonight? Go to New Jersey the next night. Go to New York the next night, or go to Pennsylvania the next night. Right. That's how you develop it. You, know, you see what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, I get you. Right, and that's <laughs> how these guys' names become household names. Yeah. There's so much on the internet, so much on TV right now. You could push this company until you're blue in the face. None of the guys are going to get that popular. Well, they, it has been a great, they haven't failed at anything yet. It's been a great success to start, and in a couple of weeks, on uh, October the 2nd, they'll start their weekly show on TNT, two hours in prime time. Yeah, but what are the guys doing in between the shows? As of now, not much. That's my point. All right. Well, you See, Vince said he runs the house show to keep the boys busy. Yeah. So they can't get involved in other stuff. Yeah, they do the pay-per-view and all this and that stuff, but they're not doing house shows that much. The boys are not working that much. They're not busy. What they should do, if they really wanted to work, mm -hmm. is get people to get with an independent group in each state. Mm -hmm. That's a good idea. And to keep the board busy. A trusted busy. independent. A trusted well, independent. Yeah, but yeah. That, that keep the board keep the board busy, but at the same time building the brand. All right. Kind of like the Hoover vacuum cleaner. Yeah. The door to door salesman stuff work just as good today as it did back then. And that's how you establish your wrestlers. Like you keep naming the group, but only somebody like you know their names. I don't know if I'd go that far, but I, compared I to WWE, it's pennies on the dollar. Yeah, but people don't know these guys' names. They don't come around long enough well, for them. Well, wrestling enough. fans, a, a great percentage of wrestling fans know they exist. Not as much as you may think. Okay, well. Because so far, nobody beat Vince yet. Of that. Well, they don't have to. That's the thing that drives me nuts. They don't have to beat Vince to be a success. They have to turn a profit and create jobs. If they can do that, I think they're, they're a great success. They're not doing success. that. They're not. No, because okay, the guys well. ain't working long enough for them to clear a profit. All that she's going to do is lose a lot of money paying guys that ain't putting. See, if I pay you $100 for my company to grow and yeah. be successful, I got to make 1000 Right. they paying out 1000 and making 100 that won't last long. Well, they start on TNT every Wednesday night starting in October. I hope you'll give it a chance and see what you think of it, good or bad. Maybe there'll be some things you like. Maybe there'll be some things you hate. If you don't keep the boys busy, you don't see the what make Vince guys so popular. You're never going to see John Cena on the Independent Show. Right. But I see Jay Leifer. Yeah. Because Jay have to work for these other companies. Well, he's exclusive to Ring of Honor now. He hasn't done independence for a few but years. You but I, what, I understand yeah, the yeah, analogy. But, yeah, yeah. yeah, because they got they to eat. Right. They got to well, eat. Well, if they have guaranteed contracts, they can eat. They can eat well without yeah, having to do you, you four see, shows a week. You see, Vince guys don't go nowhere. To see anybody on Vince's TV, you got to go to his show. Right. But with the way these other groups are, because they don't keep the boys busy, you don't have to go to a, 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 a TNA show or ring around a show to see them guys. You see them on the independent. You see them at the conventions. All right, that's fair enough. You understand what I'm yeah. saying? You know, you 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 could go to Rassicon. Yeah. You may see the, uh, what they call the guy you had me do the picture of. The Young Bucks. The Young Bucks. You see them at a Comic Con. Mm -hmm. You don't have to go to. Uh, Ring of Honor to see them. Yeah, well, they're not there anymore, so that would be hard. Yeah, but yeah. what I'm saying, you don't have to go to the whatever company they work for. I understand. I understand. To that. see them, with this, you have to go to his show to see the exclusive. Yeah. Exclusive. Well, they're going to be signed to exclusive contracts, so it'll be along the same level. They still gonna let them work out. All right. Well, we'll see how it works out. Wrestling fans, yeah. we're going to take a brief time out. We'll be back to wrap up the show. Stand by. San Diego on Saturday, October 5th. It's the WWE Live Super Show with your favorite Raw and SmackDown Live superstars. Don't miss a massive main event as Seth Rollins collides with Baron Corbin for the Universal Championship and the big dog Roman Reigns takes on Samoa Joe one-on-one. -on -one. Plus, Kofi Kingston, the man Becky Lynch, and more. It's the WWE Live Super Show on Saturday, October 5th. Tickets and WWE Superstar Experience packages 
are available. They're ready. Ready to take their rightful place amongst the literary greats. Who, 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 who? Who, you ask? The New Day! That's who. It's the Book of Booty. Shake it, love it, never be it. It's the feel-good story of the rise of the New Day. Loaded with games, trivia, coloring pages, and so much more. The Book of Booty. Shake it, love it, never be it. Available now, online, or wherever books are sold. Trenton at WWE Live. Seth Rollins and Braun Strowman will face the OC's Luke Gallows and Carl Anderson in Raw Tag Team Title Action. It's that same old recipe. It's a magic killer. Uh -huh. A one, two, three, and a just two. Sweet! We'll take on anyone that wants to step up and challenge us for these tag titles. Don't miss when WWE Live comes to Trenton, Saturday, October 19th. Tickets and WWE Superstar Experience packages are available this Friday. Wrestling fans, welcome back. Another memorable episode of Memories and Legends here on WWE Clash of Champions Weekend with Tony Atlas, the Hall of Famer. Again, we invite you, check out the eBay store if you help us out on eBay. Tony, that means you and I can get together more often. More of the other great legends and superstars can join us right here, as well as that Patreon channel. The fans get the full screen access. They get the early access. It's ad-free. It's a lot of fun on there, too, to see what we have to say before everybody else in the world does. Sound good to me, it big sounds brother. good to you. Yes, and sir. on top of that, fans, again, Millennium Wrestling Federation coming to you L-I-V-E -E live. Melrose, Massachusetts, Somerville, Massachusetts, Big updates coming every WWE pay-per-view weekend. Wait until you see who we have coming down the street. Melrose, Tony, Memorial Hall, uh, our old stomping ground, so to speak, a, a building we've had a unique relationship with since 1999. I know you and I are going to be there, of course, but we have another WWE Hall of Famer that will be joining us for a live event for the first time. Not one, but two recent WWE title holders, Tony. It is going to be a happening, and for... All that information and more, join us on social media as well as bostonwrestling.com. Tony, do you have any final thoughts on the How comic man's? You look black. You you're didn't know a, you're I still fool you black. did it. You oh, didn't yeah. know it was me, did you? No, you lost me on that yes. one. Yes. No. Uh, all right, for the Hall of Fame at Tony Atlas is good friend Andy C. I'm Dan Marotti. Special thanks to all the great folks in the back, Walter Hillside, Joe H., the Puppet, Connor Smith, Cecil the Lion, Quincy Rustani, and everyone else that helped you and yours. We'll see you hell in a cell weekend for the next Full Length Memories and Legends. Good night. <coughs> I'm Dan Marotti. And I'm John Cena Sr. Let us tell you how the action and excitement of the Millennium Wrestling Federation can help raise cash for your nonprofit cause. Experience the action and excitement of the Millennium Wrestling Federation live in your city throughout New England, the tri-state area, down through the Carolinas, out to our friends in the Midwest and beyond. If your nonprofit organization is looking for an interactive turnkey experience while putting the fun into fundraising, you've met the perfect tag team partner to work with every step of the way. The MWF offers a variety of packages for groups of almost any size, from our live events at the Boston Garden, the Kowloon Entertainment Dining Complex, and the legendary Suffolk Downs, to high school gyms and function halls. We've presented live events everywhere and anywhere. Since 2001, the MWF mission has been simple. Keep the kids off the streets. Under the leadership of President David Reese, we bring the superstars of yesterday, today, and tomorrow to your town. Not for a wrestling show, but an event that features action-packed in-ring wrestling, autograph, pose photo opportunities, Q&A sessions, and so much more. It's the best of sports and entertainment. The week of your event, we can add on to the endeavor with anti-bullying campaigns, library meet and greet reads, youth sport concussion seminars, and more. Our live events are fit for fans of any age from 5 to 95. This fall is part of our new Kids Club program. We offer live event experiences exclusively for the youngest of fans. On the flip side, we can produce a tailor-made event for fans of an older demographic as well. We work with you every step of the way to get the word out to fans near and far on our local television offerings and to over 50,000 fans and growing on our social media platforms. Your success is our success. If your group 
has had enough of candy bar and wrapping paper sales and has the energy to team with our passionate fan base, bringing the NWF experience to your community is the answer to put smiles on faces while raising cash for your cause. Contact us today to get the ball rolling for your custom-made event that you'll want to bring back year after year to your community. Don't just take it from us. Here are the folks we've teamed up with in the past. 